Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Adenilson Tavalpenj. I work for ARM. I'm based on the San Jose office in California. And today we're going to talk about optimizing CD for ARM. So first I'd like to thank the organization because uh, I think I got it lucky. Generally the first day of the conference is the best day to present anything. Because <laughs> as the days they go by, people get tired, some will start to leave, some other people will be just too much to go over. Alright, so the original question was, uh, I want to optimize Chromium for ARM, but uh, where should I start? Mm -hmm. The code base is just to be, and there are just too many areas, so what could be helpful? As a matter of fact, uh, an easier question would be try to optimize the Linux kernel, because for sure, at least you can do it much faster. So, I started to look into web pages and I realized one thing uh, to these days, the majority of content is still text and images. So I decided to start with images, and especially with Pinyin. So Pinyin is quite interesting format, it's quite powerful, has quite a few different features to improve the compression of the image. You have a pilot, you have free filters, the data itself is compressed and using GC. And but what's very really interesting is that depending on the encoder, even if you have the same content, uh, you may have different hotspots in the code. And generally speaking, DPNG and ZDIP, they are kind of brothers because uh, they were developed around the same time, around 95. So we're talking about the code base that is at least 22 years old, within C, using currently rich C style which is about uh, 40 years old. But overall, I think we should be grateful to the guys who worked on this because uh, it was part of uh, an heroic effort to allow people to have free access. Oh, sorry. Can uh, okay, we go here? Better? Okay, don't want to stay in the way. So, I was saying that it works really well and uh, it's a uh, bit of work. Right, so uh, meet Mr. Parrot. I think this image is quite complex and interesting because uh, it has what looks like a texture uh, to represent the feathers and the bird. It's a pretty well sized big image, it's like almost 2 megabytes. And it also has transparency and uses spread filters. But uh, just like in nature, uh, all parrots are not created equally, they're not equal. So even though visually speaking, um, those three images they look like the same, they are actually quite different. So the first one was the original one, was 2.7 megabytes. The second one used a, a PNG encoder called Zoltfly, which is a cool, uh, open source project. And the later one was using uh, the palette to try to optimize for size. So when you have to optimize something, the first thing you have to do is to have a look on a per session. So for those three images, even though visually the content was pretty much the same, the most expensive functions, they were different. So for the first case, inflated fast was uh, really relevant, while for the third case, was the other way around. Spun pad was more expensive. And, but generally speaking, it was possible to identify four good candidates for optimization. So let's talk a little bit about Cindy and Neon. I promise to be really fast here. But what is Neon? It's an architecture extension for Cindy, uh, proposed for ARM V7 initially. And you can saw on ARM V7 specifically was official, for ARM V8 is actually mandatory. But uh, there is some confusion sometimes because, as an example, the first Tedra SOC, it didn't have Neon. And um, basically, you have to make sure that if you are building or code and enable new, your target actually supports a feature. For new devices that are based on ARMv8, that's not a concern at all. Right, 
good. So um, on RMV7, you'll have about 60 registers. There are 128 bits whose type is Q0 all the way to Q15. Um, and you'll have 32 registers for 64 bits, but there are actually a different view on the 128 bits of registers. So it's not like 16 plus 32, right? So you say we're using the registers D0 and D1, we're actually referring to the register Q0. And uh, it's pretty cool because it has some very really nice instructions to load, store data, add, multiply. We even have some instructions that you say we have packet data like RGBA, RGBA, RGBA. You can say uh, store all the say uh, red components in a single register. And as also say the blue component in another register and so on. This is called this is called the interle interleaves. <coughs> And when you have to say uh, store it back, you can also say change the order of uh, the, the, the pixel components by just uh, referring to the register that you want to store. You can actually use this to do some really cool tweaks. So, well, just like a curiosity. Okay, for RV8, it's pretty much the same, but you have double, uh, twice as many registers, which is good. That's, that is an, an example of say, <coughs> performing that. Say that you have say, two registers, and um, you have a representation that can use say, a, a, a component of the register for say, storing a scalar value, say 60 bits. So if you have a Q register, you can have some representation for one of the 860 uh, bits uh, elements. And you can perform a simple um, add of those uh, components by, say, using a third register to store some of them to the other two registers. But actually, there is an issue, a potential issue on this code. I'm not sure if you guys noticed. No. All right, so the issue is that uh, uh, there are no carry ons between the lines. So, say, you have two uh, 16 bit integers. And some of them would actually overflow to not carry on to the next line. So you have to make sure, uh, sometimes you have to promote from say 16 bits to 32 bits. Okay, so let's go back to the candidates. We had uh, two candidates on Z. One was in play fast, the other was Ever 32. We had this, this uh, candidate in Blink. And the, well, the later candidate was inside of the PNG. I decided to not work on the blink code because there is an ongoing effort to uh, phase out the blink image uh, decoders and use some new classes in Skia for performing both image decoding and source image encoding. So I was like, that. okay, I could easily make this like three or four times faster. But on the other hand, say one year from now, it's going to be lost. So let's start with Z. So uh, an interesting question is uh, why Z? So what is really crazy about Z is that it's used pretty much everywhere. Well. It's used inside of the Linux kernel, it's used by Skia, it's used by Chromeact, which is the network stack of Chrome, that by itself is used by lots of Java applications. And uh, this is our old code base, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, correctly, that is any kind of optimizations for ARM CPUs. So the whole problem statement was to identify the potential for optimization and verify what would be the post effects for Chromium. So I can say that so far the hardest part wasn't optimizing, but it was definitely upstream, this change. Do you think it's interesting? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the implementation. Right, so let's start with other 32. So other 32 is a checksum, somewhat similar to CRC32, but it's faster. It's used for, say, networking code and context of PNG. We will have to copy the other 32 checksum on the uncompressed data. Eventually, also use this CRC32 checksum on the compressed data. So imagine that you have, say, a 3 megabytes PNG. We have to calculate the other checksum 
on those three megabytes after you have decompress it. So it can easily sometimes be like 10 times bigger, like 30 megabytes. Um, in case of Perigeon server, generally the compressed segments are around 8 kilobytes to 16 kilobytes, even though the spec allows it to go uh, as big as 32 kilobytes. Concerning the maximum size of a PNG, it can be up to 2 gigabytes. So that is really well documented because there is a spec. As a matter of fact, what I think is interesting because the PNG was the first W3C spec published. Okay, so this is a really naive implementation of the other 32 checksum. So the basic idea is that uh, you have to look through the data vector, accumulate it, then perform modules. Uh, this model, module operations, they're expensive, so one way to try to make work code faster is to try to skip them. You can actually accumulate the data up to 5,552 without the risk of having overflow, which is what the Zenic uh, implementation of other 32 does. Okay. So the first problem was that the Zenic implementation is actually pretty fast. When you compare it against the uh, naive implementation, it's about seven times faster on ARM. I think on Intel is about eight times faster. And especially if you guys are you use it to the idea of uh, vector programming, it's extremely difficult to try to represent this. Because they still have the first component, which was the A element, which if, if you look on the formula, it's actually a uh, really simple, it's just the sum, right? But the second component is actually the depends on the first component. So was it a bit tricky to try to represent that? So basically, one solution was to look back to the formula. And if you look at it, you could actually represent the second component as the product of a scalar by the data element in the data array. So that was the trick to uh, actually implement a vectorized version of it. So uh, this is highly technical drawing from my notebook from January. Uh, I think I was describing this like at 3 a.m. on a Sunday. Uh, as you can see, uh, I was a little bit tired because uh, I was a little bit shaky. <laughs> yeah, but it's like they say, no pain, no gain. Right? And, but the basic idea is that say we'll have a vector, we will perform um, the sum, and then we will recombine the, the elements at the end of the, the, the function, and we will have, say, the other component in the sum. So, this is just a screenshot of the code, the new implementation. So, you can imagine that since we're going to be working with vectors of data that can be up to, say, technically 32 kilobytes, uh, you cannot have, say, a, a vector of 32 kilobytes and uh, you're applying it on top of the data. So, it's like this you have a window of 32 elements. Those would they represent this color value from the formula. And you're going to be, say, applying this in, in a segment of the data, which is first we load the data, and next we maybe add. We, uh, we do what's called a pair add, and then we multiply. And we store it and we repeat this all along the vector, right? There are other stuff that we have to be aware of, but the real high level idea of it is that um, it's not that complicated as soon as you crack the mathematical formula for doing it. So, what was the result? Well, it was pretty nice. Uh, it was about three times faster than the optimized ZDIP C implementation. Depending on the core, the battery, the manufacturer, the silicon quality, the alignment of the planets, your performance can be a little bit different. So it was between, say, uh, an ARM 7 that I tested was 18%, and an ARM 8 that I tested was around 7% on the decoding of the image. So it was really cool because basically I touched Zilli that helped the deep engine, which by the way helped the blink, which by the way helped the chrome. 
Uh, so let's talk about the second candidate. The second candidate was implemented by uh, my teammate, Simon Posey. That was the inflate fast. A very high level idea of this that it performs, say, wider loads and stores. So that was like part of the patch where the original C code would be performing, say, a reading and write of the data, say, one, data, uh, one point at each time. They repeat the code three times because that allows you to better exploit the pipeline to have uh, some degree of parallelism. So instead of that, you uh, you call say a function that will perform a wide load using say a load and storing the data in say a 128 bits register. And when you have to write, you do pretty much the same, do like a vstore. Of course, there are uh, other nasty tricks on implementation. Because uh, basically, CDIP has an internal buffer. You have a sliding window where you're going to be reading the data, and then it will be right into this buffer. So uh, basically, it's, um, if you do a wide store and a wide load, you would actually, in some situations, perform what would be like an overflow in the amount of the data that we're supposed to read. But since you also have plenty of the space on your internal buffer, that is OK, not a problem. Right. Actually, there is a potential problem that I will discuss later in the presentation. Okay, so far so good. And uh, later our method was uh, inside of PMG. It was implemented by my, team, by my teammate, Richard Townsend. So it was possible to make the initial code about 10 to 30 percent faster. That also depends if the image has a palette or not. So uh, some PMGs, they use this feature. Other pages they don't, so your mileage may vary. Okay, so what was the real impact of those three patches? So this is a chrome trace uh, showing the time that is spent for the code and PNG of that uh, parrot image, the one that has a, a palette that I showed it initially uh, on the top. So if we look over there, I'm sure you guys can actually read it. But we were spending about 160 milliseconds to decode that image. I actually wrote, wrote it over here in the top for you know, to see it. And the second most expensive method was inside of the compositor, where the um, uh, image cache is being populated. So the compositor code would take about 160 milliseconds. All right, so after apply all the three patches, that drop it to 73 milliseconds. It's about a 1.6 times improvement. And it's really interesting because if you look on the CPU sub time now, the compositor method that populates the image cache is actually taking longer to execute than we spend the code in the compressed PNG. I reported that to a uh, compositor guys. I think there is someone working to address this issue. But uh, that was pretty good, I would say. But not next comes the following question, all right, player? How good is this optimization? You have to have some frame of reference, right? So I talked about comparing ARM to Intel. Of course, that is comparing apples to oranges. <laughs> because uh, first, uh, there is a difference in the price of the processors. Next, there is also a difference in the power that you have available and could go on the whole day. So, I decided to compare a Snapdragon that was uh, released to the market in 2014, the Nexus 6, versus an uh, Intel M5 that was released in late 2015. So just to keep in mind, one has a 2 megabytes LG cache, the other has a 4 megabytes uh, cache. One has a 28 nanometers uh, lithography, the other is 14, so that's about three generations of silicon. Uh, one is a ultra book, so you are connected to the power. The other has to run on your pocket. And what I'm not so sure if, is if uh, Android 6 has an energy aware scheduler, because the EAS kernel, um, unlike the traditional Linux kernel, it will say calculate the amount of power that will have available on your battery to say then change the CPU frequency. And in case if you have a big little uh, architecture, we will also define where to schedule the task to run, either the big cores or the little cores. Right, so all things considered. 
you felt like comparing uh, Toyota Prius to a Mustang or like uh, comparing it to a Camaro, right? So in this case, uh, Intel had lots of advantages over this old uh, silicon. So the question is, how, 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 what was the data that I collected? So this was for Intel for the very same image. It was about 66 milliseconds. If you guys remember, um, on the ARM processor was about uh, 60 milliseconds. So without the new optimizations, we are operating on this level. With new optimizations, we are able to bring it up over here. But there is, is about 10% uh, difference on the, the coding uh, time. And I thought initially, okay, that's, that's okay. I mean, we're talking about like a two years old ARM processor. That's about three generations of silicon behind, so that's good enough. But then I looked at the side of Chrome, and actually on Chrome, they do have a few optimizations for Intel. And they have the implementation for CRC32 using SSE2. And I implemented CRC32 for ARM V8 using the native instruction. And also say probably the 10% difference can be explained because of uh, Chrome Z having uh, some optimizations for Intel. So I would say, well, it wasn't half bad, right? Uh, a previous pretty much was able to run the same uh, uh, pace as, say, uh, a Camaro. Okay, so what were the lessons learned? Um, basically, ARM cores can be benefited a lot from the optimizations. We are sometimes talking about performance gains around two uh, generations of silicon. And definitely pays off to work in a lower layer in the software stack when you know, think about Chrome. Okay, so was it a happy end? No. Uh, it was for, because we had we had the under 32 implementation done by January, the inflate fast optimization done by uh, February. And by March, the palette expansion um, implementation. So in theory, all this code should be already in Chrome since last March. But uh, I was requested to perform a, a benchmarking between canonical ZLib and uh, the multiple ZLib ports that are available. Next, I was uh, I decided to upstream some of these ARM optimizations to the container that I found, which was the next generation of ZLib engine. And the whole idea initially was to try to move Chrome to a better and maintained and more performance ZLib. Because today we are in a situation where Chrome ZLib is a fork. Uh, all right, so the study uh, performance is available on this link. It's like a, an article with a couple pages comparing different ZLibs. Uh, by April, I think we had the, the, the first optimizations streaming to CDBNG. One problem I found is that um, Chromium has PDF, and PDF is used to open PDFs, and PDF had another copy of a ZLib, which, by the way, was an outdated ZLib with no security issues. So the first thing I did was to move um, PDF from ZLib to the latest release. And next, I showed to the guys that it uh, was possible to run PDF on just fine using Chrome and ZD with the, 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 the advantage that at least for Intel, and Chrome and ZD already had some optimizations. But there was a major block in the whole plan. Uh, ZD next generation they never released uh, a stable release. So if you look on the chronology of events, <coughs> so by January, I did the initial study. And I implemented that in 32. By February, my teammates they joined the effort. So uh, there was implementation for Inflate Fast and for uh, PNG Padlet. So by early April, we already had all the three paths done. By April, we were able to stream the, uh, the paths to the ZD next generation. By the fall month, I saw the issue of PDF and CD. But when it was almost, we still didn't have any kind of a release. So that forced me to change the strategy. Uh, I posted to Blink Lab, announced the idea of, hey, let's optimize for ARM, let's land this patch. <coughs> and we landed the patch, like uh, two or three weeks ago. 
So this was one of the performance plots. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that as soon as the patch landed, the time spent for the code and the PNG dropped abruptly. So the single patch was an improvement of around 15%, 20%. But as I uh, used to say, life sometimes is tough. And uh, you can never really know what is uh, the workflow that some people may have. So what happens that um, Cronet uses Zlib and they built for ARM v6. I don't know why. But the build system was enabled Neon for ARM v6. And you always want to build for ARM v6, therefore the build broke. So between landing the patch and having it revert, it took just three hours. <laughs> I started looking into it, I figured out what was wrong, I proposed a solution, and then Chris <coughs> Bloom from Chrome from Google. He uploaded the patch, I reviewed the patch, and then we landed, next we landed the inflate fast optimization. <coughs> but then again I was up for another nasty surprise. As I mentioned, Chromenet is used for uh, quite a few Java applications, like uh, Google Meet and others. And one of these applications broke, basically looking to stop it working. Needless to say, the optimization was reversed. Uh, that was uh, a little bit disappointing, to say the least. But I uh, hope, I would say the good news are that uh, Michel Fimov from Google, he found the bug was inside of the Java app. Basically, they were relying on the, um, on the final behavior, which has changed with the optimization. So we were able, uh, so this was when the code was reverted. So we had like, on this specific plot, about 300 milliseconds for the coding. The code was reverted, but it took almost 360. But um, as soon as we had clearance, and it was clear the code, uh, the Zilib code, the new code was okay. We related it again, and this is so where we had the optimization, this is where we didn't have the optimization, this is where we have the optimization again. Alright, so what would be the, the next steps for this whole uh, story? Would be to end the other touch to optimization. So, uh, Noel Bordel from Google, he implemented the same algorithm for Intel. So we decided to land uh, a single patch with the implementations for Intel and ARM. This landed last Friday. Uh, next, we should also uh, land the PNG optimization. That's going to help out for PNG images with pallets. And ARM V8 has a series of 32 instructions that has the correct polynomial. So I have a patch that makes uh, the execution of the series about 10 times faster. I tested it on my uh, Google Pixel and improved the uh, PNG decoding about 7%. So on top of those 40%, we're going to have another 7%. And compression comes next. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I have time, uh, I'll try to show something that happened here while I was flying from, so from San Francisco to Spain. Um, all right, so I think I have a another chart here. I think it's interesting because you see, <clears throat> this was when we were, then the patch was reverted, then we relayed the patch last Thursday, and this was after landing the other 32 patch. Right. So basically, uh, if you can measure uh, the performance gains, uh, that's quite helpful. I uh, should totally you know when you are working with optimization, try to find ways to measure the benefits of the optimizations. <coughs> okay, so um, because the other search tool is already on Chrome, uh, what I can do next is uh, to land the link range optimization, to land the search search tool optimization. There is an issue if you play it back. Because uh, basically, the label offers two, two uh, public functions to use the uh, to use the decompression code. The first one is inflate, that was initially um, part of uh, ZDB release in '95. Then, in 2002 or 2003, they came up with this inflate back. The inflate back allows the user to supply a buffer 
to the zip, so the zip doesn't have any kind of guarantees about the size of this buffer. So the neon uh, white store would actually overflow this buffer. But uh, when you start, the whole problem, code base, the playbacks never use it. But uh, still we are planning to fix it, so the fix is really easy. If you are using, say, inflate, where we have control on the buffer, you use the fast code. If you are using the inflate back and supply an external buffer, you use the original code. So it's like, a, actually, I already have a patch for it, but I thought that it was a better idea to land it uh, after return, return home, because it's quite common that when you land something just before it crashes, you're going to break something. <laughs> and about compression, oh well, yeah, I, I implemented the one method. There was a few window that helped with compression between 2 to 10 percent. So uh, the first new optimization is going to be featured on Chromium, Chromium M62. The second uh, implementation, together with the first, is going to be featured on Chromium M63. <coughs> and I'll work to try to get uh, the LeapMG and the CRC optimization on Chrome uh, M64. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that uh, when you optimize inflate fast in Zilli, you're going to also optimize loading of pages because most of the uh, web pages today, uh, the web server serves this content using uh, content encoded GZ. So basically, you're going to fetch the resource from the web server, compress it. They don't have to decompress this, and they don't start you know, parsing the HTML, etc. Et 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 so this initial uh, step is going to benefit from in optimization on Zilli. So for people who are using Zilli, I would consider the idea of having a local program on Zilli because uh, if it's secure to fix, um, there is one secure to fix uh, idea on Zilli, uh, on Chrome Zilli. And um, as we saw in the slides, um, having optimizations there is going to help uh, pretty much the whole software stack. So, some special thanks. <coughs> I would like to uh, say my thanks to Italia, and especially uh, Xavier, for inviting me. It's my first uh, um, uh, web page, uh, web page is half fast. So far, I'm, I'm having a great time. I uh, would also like to thank Arm for sponsoring the trip, and especially my manager for allowing me to work on these four months. Uh, Chris Boulogne on Google, because he was the first guy who actually approved it, the first optimization to land on Chromium. Um, Guilherme Interior from my team for reviewing the sites. And we have the team in UK, where we have Dave, Matteo, Richard, and Stephen. And the team in the US, where, where is myself, Amorim, and Simon. And finally, Compiler Explorer, because I use the Compiler Explorer a lot to be able to easily type some new code and see what would be the generated assembly. It was like you know, a time saver. Was actually, if I ever met the guy who came up with the compiler explorer, I'm going to pay him as much beer he wants. Because it's an amazing tool. I love it. Generally, but it's unbelievable. All right, so uh, questions? Go. Did you try upstreaming your optimizations to upstream Zilin? Zilin. Okay, that, that's a good question. Right, so the question was uh, if I try to upstream the optimizations to canonical Zlib. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the packs they are collecting this for I think five months now. No feedback at all. Uh, I was told that Mark Adler, who is the current maintainer of canonical Zlib, was told that it's like, you know, uh, a real person. Because yeah. Uh, I imagine actually it was kind of a lash, I don't know. I mean, the guy had, I mean, his name is Mark Adler, and he has even checked some after his name, right? Uh, but yeah, so basically I wrote to this guy, I spoke to all the packs. Each two weeks, I know, I, because there is a, the code is available on GitHub, right? Each two weeks, you know, I write like a ping, like, hey, any feedback? Hey, are you there? But, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna work. Huh? Besides, if you look on uh, the history of Zilli, I think the last 10 years they haven't accepted any performance uh, optimizations. Right. But I don't blame them. 
because uh, when you're talking about neon code and SSC code, you're talking sometimes about some really crazy code. It's quite common the guys who will contribute this code, they will just disappear. We have to remember that CD is an old project. They still have, they still have to do for more than C++, or Turbo C, for, I don't know, OS, OS Warp or some long-gone compilers, some really long-gone operating systems. So I can understand why, say, a Montaigne would prefer to have stability. But uh, since we work with browsers and we care about performance, we, we have to take over this um, kind of uh, burden. So yeah, I mean, I would love to see this patch on Canonical CD, but I don't see that happen. Unless something, I don't know, some kind of miracle happens. So the next step is that he said you, we should upgrade to Chromium Z11. Is that is that buildable as a shared library without checking out the Chromium? So yes, yeah, so no one's gonna do that. <laughs> uh, sort of. I mean, uh, unlike uh, Canonical ZD, where you have a, a configure script, you, know, you also have a CMake and build system. And uh, Chromium Z11 uses GM. I'm not a build system expert. I know that uh, in case of PDF, since they already use it, GM, it's easy to have uh, the Chromium Zlib as uh, uh, adapts, right? Uh, but I would say maybe after we are done with all the optimization work, we <coughs> could have a look on try to say uh, make it easier for external projects to use Chromium Zlib. But uh, yeah, I would say today probably would have to write our own build system, but it's not that difficult because it's just two files. Questions? A what? Sorry, how is the question again? How many files? Less than 30, because uh, the ARM files for the first optimization is about three, and for the second optimization is just a single file, right? Yeah, so it's not that many. As a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I contacted the Zlib uh, owner in Firefox. I asked them which kind of Zlib they're using. And uh, since they are still using like plain uh, vanilla canonical Zlib, so since Firefox now seems to be a uh, really you know, uh, making some progress uh, towards performance, uh, I would say this would be like a low lane, uh, low hanging fruit. Have a look. Questions? Okay, so I think we're done. Thanks for your time.